Bernard, I've been following fine-tuning for many decades as a real potential probe of the nature of reality. And I know, and I've, I've followed your work, have been involved from the very beginning in the modern era of, of fine-tuning. And I'd love you to give me the, the history of uh, your involvement in fine-tuning so we can follow the development of the field. Okay. And maybe I should just start off by putting it in an even broader context, by saying that, of course, mankind started with the anthropocentric view, which says that man is the center of the universe. And of course, that idea was demolished. And we found that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe at all. And, and more importantly, Newton developed the idea of a mechanistic universe mm -hmm. in which the laws of nature more or less continue oblivious to whether there's anybody mm -hmm. observing the world at all. And from that perspective, the observer became completely unimportant. Mm -hmm. the, the laws of the universe would carry on regardless of whether anybody was observing it. But then in, in the 20th century, they developed what has become called the anthropic principle, which says that actually certain features of the universe seem to have to be the way they are, because otherwise life, or at least an observer, couldn't be here to ask questions about it. <laughs> and and really, these, this question came out of cosmology itself, out of physics and cosmology, not just from philosophy. And if one traces the history of that in a little bit more detail, I suppose the crucial paper was probably in 1974, when Brandon Carter mm. pointed out the existence of these extraordinary coincidences involving the, the constants of physics, which seem to be necessary to have observers in the universe. And indeed, it was uh, Carter who coined the term anthropic, mm -hmm. which is actually a, a rather bad term. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he regrets it now mm -hmm. because it comes from the Greek word anthropos, which means man, but actually these tunings clearly aren't anything to do with <laughs> humans in particular. They're, they're, they're to do with the evolution of maybe complexity in the universe. But that was in 1974. And then I came into the story, I think, in about 1979, when myself and Martin Rees mm -hmm. wrote a paper which was published in Nature. And this was, the, I suppose, the first paper to give a, a, a broad overview of all the various coincidences which seem to be necessary for life. And what were some of them? Because that really <laughs> was the seminal paper that got the field started in a, in, in a, in a more precise um, experimental way. Well, in order to talk about these coincidences, I mean, I think perhaps one has to make a distinction between different types of tunings which arise. Yes. One of the points of our paper was that actually most of the scales of structures which exist in the universe, all the way from the very smallest to the people, to planets, to stars, to galaxies, to the universe itself, those scales of structure depend upon a few basic dimensionless constants which arise in physics. And because of that, you automatically find there are certain surprising coincidences, if you like, between these different scales of, constant, of structure. And just to give a simple example, the size of a human being is essentially the geometric mean of the Planck scale, the smallest scale that could ever exist, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and the, the scale of the observable universe, which is 10 to the 27 centimeters. Now, at first you might think, well, that's, that's remarkable, that's full mm -hmm. of mystical significance, mm -hmm. where the geometric mean of mm -hmm. the smallest and the largest, but actually it's not. It was just a result of straightforward physics. Mm. And so one of the points of our paper was to point out there are a lot of these relationships which are actually perfectly explicable. Then there are coincidences which involve what is sometimes called the weak anthropic principle. Now, the weak anthropic principle says, given the constants of nature, there is a selection effect on when and where we observe the universe. And I suppose the most famous of these weak anthropic coincidences involves the, the question of the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. And this was an answer to a question which was first posed by Robert Dickey in, in the 1960s. Because we know the universe is it's 14 billion years old, and so the size of the universe is 14 billion light years. 
So you might say, but why is the universe so enormous? It's, it's the size is 14 mm -hmm. billion light years mm -hmm. because that's how far light can have traveled since the beginning, well, since the Big Bang. Now, you might just say, well, we, it just happens that the universe is 14, let's say 10 billion years old to be more rough. Now, Dickey said, no, in order to have observers in the universe, you have to have carbon and, and, and elements. It's those efficient time. It, yeah. them, yes, those elements have to be made in stars, which then explode, and it requires a certain time for those stars to go through their nuclear burning, the, the main sequence time of a star. Now, the main sequence time, time of a star like the sun is about roughly 10 million years, so you have to wait 10 million years yeah. in order to have any elements around for us to be here. On the other hand, if you waited much longer than that, there would be no stars yeah, left. Better. And so there's a little window of time in which observers are bound to be here. And it's not saying the universe doesn't exist outside this little window of time. It's just saying that if you're observing the universe, you expect it to be something like 10 billion years old. Right, right. And really that's, that's a matter of a logic. It's saying that there's this, our existence imposes a selection mm. effect. Mm. And it's no more surprising than saying that we, there's a selection effect in space. We have to be on a planet which is close to a, a sun. Now, how do you get fine-tuning in there? Because uh, this assume, are you assuming fine-tuning of these uh, constants of physics and in cosmology? Well, or are you discovering them and then having to explain them? With the that particular coincidence, as I said, it doesn't particularly require a fine-tuning. It, it is a fine-tuning, but it's, a, it's something which is predicted by ordinary physics. Right. And also, it's a rather rough fine-tuning because sure. it only gives you the age of the, the universe sure. of you know, factor two or three. But actually, if you then ask what is the age of the universe, if it's the main sequence time of the star, that depends, as it turns out, on, a, on a, an important parameter, what's called the, the gravitational coupling constant, which is a very small number which determines the strength of gravity. Mm -hmm. So actually, it turns out that this, this weak anthropic constraint on the age of the universe is also a constraint on the value of the gravitational fine structure constant, mm. which is this tiny value of about 10 to the minus 40. Mm. Now, <clears throat> this was the weak anthropic principle. Far more challenging was the realization that there are relationships between the physical constants themselves which seem to be yeah. necessary for us to be here. And I can give you a few examples of that if, you, if you'd like. One such coincidence is the fact that you need to have stars which are both convective and radiative in their outer envelopes. That's to say the, the, the heat generated in the core can get to the surface yeah, sure. by radiative processes or convective processes. And there's a, that only happens around a critical mass. And that critical mass is in the mass range in which stars actually exist. Only because of a remarkable tuning between the gravitational fine structure constant, which is this tiny value of 10 to the minus 40, and the, the electrical fine structure constant, which is called the fine structure constant, which is roughly 10 to the minus two. It's one over 137. Mm. <clears throat> now, it turns out that the reason we have both these types of stars, the radiative and the convective stars, is only because of this remarkable tuning, that the <clears throat> gravitational fine structure constant is the 20th power of the electric <laughs> fine structure constant. Another example is to do with supernova. We know s stars explode, and the elements that are baked inside them then get disseminated into the outside universe where they eventually become part of us. But actually, that only arises because there's a remarkable fine-tuning between the weak interaction and the gravitational Fine structure so as, as this has occurred from your 1979 paper, what was the other events that, um, that occurred that were the, sort of the milestones to the um, situation we have today? I mean, we're at this conference in Crete, uh, fine-tuning, uh, physics of fine-tuning. I mean, so this is, fine-tuning now has become a, 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 a mainstream activity. So what were some of the other major events that get, get us here? Um, Originally, the, the paper was met with a lot of skepticism because it, it, it seemed too almost philosophical, almost theological in, in its nature, and people felt it was not really 
proper science. But since then, there have been changes. And in particular, physicists themselves produce the idea of the multiverse, the idea that our universe might just be one of a whole ensemble of universes in which the constants were different. And that very naturally would explain uh, why there can be a selection effect. Because we would, if there were many, many universes, we would have to be, by necessity, sure. in the universe which had the constants required for our to be here. Now, historically, what happened was that, as a result of that, there were a series of conferences. For example, there was, there was an important conference in 2001 in Cambridge on the fine tunings. There was another conference in Stanford in 2003, and then another conference in Cambridge in 2005, where leading physicists and indeed philosophers in this area came together. And that resulted, in fact, in, a, in the book which I edited called Universe or Multiverse, which, mm. which came out in 2007. And I think that was quite important in the history of the subject because it, it did show that actually, you know, a lot of eminent scientists take this subject seriously enough to, to write about it. Doesn't mean they necessarily are convinced that it's, it's true, but it's, at least they are convinced that it's a, a serious scientific question which can be addressed in a, in a respectable way. But the key point was that by that time, by the 2000s, one had a theory of physics which predicted the multiverse, which therefore gave a, a reasonable basis for understanding how these anthropic fine-tunings might come about.